Hi again. For our last video on how to measure bioenergetics in intact cells, I want to talk about a few other measurements that you can do in intact cells. One of them is a measurement of delta pH. Now, as we saw, a proton motive force has two components. It has the electrical component, so the membrane potential, but also delta pH participates in proton motive force. So under some conditions, you might want to measure delta pH. You can measure delta pH by uh, using mitochondrially encoded proteins that are pH sensitive, and there are a number of fluorescent proteins that are pH sensitive. In fact, most uh, green fluorescent proteins are sensitive to pH, but there are some that are designed to be specifically pH sensitive. And measuring mitochondrial pH with these proteins, and then uh, accumulating in the cell the esterified form of BCCF, which is a fluorescent probe that will give you the measurement of the pH in the cytosol. And then by comparing these two pHs, you can get delta pH if you need that measurement. Another really cool measurement that's, I think, underutilized is the measurement of mitochondrial NADPH fluorescence. So NAD and NADPH, when in the reduced form, are both autofluorescent. You can measure the fluorescence of these species simply by their autofluorescence without adding any probes. And you can see these, uh, the fluorescence of these species in mitochondria specifically because most NAD in the cytosol is in the oxidized form, while NADH is predominant in mitochondria. So mitochondria really light up uh, in the wavelengths that NADPH is fluorescent. And this is like oxygen consumption. It's a measurement of something that's directly used in oxidative phosphorylation. NADH is oxidized, and it does not involve a secondary probe. So it's really a good measurement to think about. Another thing that has autofluorescence in mitochondria are flavoproteins. So flavins are fluorescent when oxidized. It's the opposite of NADH. Uh, and there are lots of flavins in mitochondria. Autofluorescence from flavins in mitochondria is thought to be mostly complexes 1 and 2, but it actually can include other flavor proteins, including those that are in the matrix and not only the ones in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, so just so you have an idea of these autofluorescences, this is autofluorescence of NADPH in mitochondria. And we don't know if it's NAD or NADP, that's why we put the P in parentheses. Uh, these are mitochondria that were stained with a membrane potential probe, so you can see that the distribution of fluorescence is exactly the same. It's in the mitochondrial area where these nucleotides are reduced and therefore fluorescent. If you add cyanide, if you inhibit electron transport with cyanide, NADH is going to be more reduced, so you're going to have more uh, fluorescence. On the other hand, if you're measuring flavor protein fluorescence, the flavor proteins are also going to be more reduced, but they're less fluorescent when reduced, so you're going to have less fluorescence of flavor proteins. On the other hand, when you add FCCP, you uncouple these mitochondria, now NAD is going to be mostly oxidized, so very low fluorescence, while flavor proteins are going to be oxidized with very high fluorescence. So these are endogenous probes of mitochondrial function, and I think they should be thought about more. We should think of using them more often because they're really interesting in terms of looking at mitochondrial function in situ. Finally, many people measure ATP levels as a measurement of oxidative phosphorylation and function. One problem with that is that under many conditions, the concentration of ATP in the cell actually doesn't change much, but you have a change in dynamics of the production of ATP. So if you don't see a change in ATP levels, this doesn't mean that oxidative phosphorylation didn't change. And actually, you should probably measure ATP re uh, uh, construction of uh, the synthesis of ATP from ADP, or at least measure ATP versus ADP and ANP levels. Uh, again, ATP levels are actually reflected quite well by measurements of oxygen consumption. So from oxygen consumption traces, you can estimate ATP production quite nicely. So maybe measuring ATP itself is not the first thing you should consider doing within a cell or within mitochondria. Uh, we spoke about in the last class uh, about ionic transport in mitochondria, so I want to talk 
about measuring ion transport in situ and intact cells also. Potassium transport in mitochondria is very interesting, but not necessarily very easy to measure in intact cells. There are probes that are mitochondrially located for potassium, but the problem is that because potassium uptake is accompanied by water, potassium concentrations don't really change much with changes in potassium uptake into mitochondria. So it can be a bit tricky to measure. That's why I want to talk more about a measurement that's more often conducted in the literature, which is measuring mitochondrial calcium uptake. And there are various ways to measure mitochondrial calcium uptake in intact cells. One often used probe, and this is a fluorescent probe, is ROAD2, which is a probe that is thought to accumulate predominantly in mitochondria and fluoresces in the presence of calcium. Uh, and actually, ROAD2 does accumulate in mitochondria in many cell types under many conditions. I've seen many papers uh, in which mitochondria specifically are beautifully stained by ROAD2. On the other hand, I've also seen conditions in which you put ROAD2 in cells and it accumulates everywhere, not in mitochondria specifically. So be careful, just because this probe is sold as a mitochondrial calcium probe, don't believe in that. Actually look and make sure that your probe is accumulating specifically in mitochondria before conducting your experiments. Uh, another way to measure calcium in mitochondria is to encode a fluorescent protein that responds to calcium. And there are a number of green or yellow fluorescent proteins that have been developed to measure calcium in mitochondria. Uh, there's an example of PERICAM here. Um, some of these probes, and these are the best ones, are ratiometric. So you can measure one fluorescence for the bound probe to calcium and another fluorescence for the probe that's not bound to calcium. And that's very interesting because with the ratio, you eliminate problems of different levels of expression of these proteins, and you also eliminate problems of changes in fluorescence of these proteins that are not related to calcium binding. So changes in pH specifically can change the fluorescence of all fluorescent proteins. Another group of mitochondrial calcium sensors are, are encoded in mitochondria also and are modified at quarins. These are also very often used and very good probes for mitochondrial calcium encoded uh, and, and expressed in mitochondria. For all these probes, you have to think of affinity and you have to think of saturation. And saturation specifically can be the problem because as I told you when we were talking about ion uptake in isolated systems, mitochondria can take up so much calcium that it precipitates within the matrix. And all these probes are actually only going to measure the free calcium. So if you go over this level in which precipitation is happening, you may be underestimating the amount of calcium in mitochondria just by using mitochondrial probes. A solution for this can be to actually inhibit mitochondrial calcium uptake, uncouple mitochondria so they release calcium, and measure how much calcium increases in the cytosol using cytosolic calcium probes. So combining these two techniques, you could probably measure calcium in situ much better. Uh, very important to have a loading control to make sure that your proteins are expressed at equal levels under your different conditions, and to make sure that your fluorescent probes are actually accumulating in mitochondria and accumulating at equal levels. Um, I do not recommend any of these to be used in flow cytometry because you can have a whole bunch of other changes that lead to changes in fluorescence. And when you're looking at fluorescence of this whole particle of the cell in flow cytometry, you can miss this. Flow cytometry is particularly inadequate for ROAD2 without a control to make sure that ROAD2 is within mitochondria because ROAD2 can under many conditions accumulate in other places in the cell. Finally, always remember that if you have a change in inner membrane potential, a change in the amount of mitochondria per cell, a change in morphology, all of these can affect fluorescence, both of encoded proteins and of loaded probes. So always make sure that your changes really are attributable to changes in calcium uptake, and that's true for everything. Finally, we talked uh, in the last class about the mitochondrial permeability transition, about this 
inner membrane permeabilization that happens with excessive calcium. And you can measure permeability transition in intact cells. Originally, this was done by treating the cells with marked deoxyglucose, which is not taken up by mitochondria. And then you would isolate mitochondria and see how much of this deoxyglucose is in mitochondria. And the more permeability transition you had, the more deoxyglucose can get in because you lose this inner membrane impermeability, so the more deoxyglucose would be in your isolated mitochondria. Now that's a bit of a complicated experiment to do, so another way to do this is through fluorescence. It uh, was developed by John LeMasters, in which you load mitochondria with calcine, uh, and basically it's going to fluoresce within mitochondria. You see this kind of pattern in the cell that's typical of a mitochondrial location. Then if you submit these cells to a situation in which permeability transition happens, such as ischemia reperfusion, you see a release of this calcine, and it's now in the cytosol because of this loss of inner mitochondrial membrane integrity. Uh, and as expected for permeability transition, you can see here that the process is inhibited by low pH and also inhibited by the presence of cyclosporin A. So that really shows that it's the mitochondrial permeability transition. So those are the things I wanted to tell you about measurements in intact cells. For next class, we're going to talk about measurements of mitochondrial oxidants and antioxidants. Now, this is a subject that in the Nichols and Ferguson book there isn't a whole lot of, but it's something that many people measure and many people are interested in measuring mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, so I really want to give one class on this subject. And as reading material, I'm going to recommend a review I wrote myself in Redox Biology. So if you could please download this review, this is an open access review in Redox Biology. Um, it's a 2019 review in my name, and that's the subject that we're going to use as reading matter for the next class in addition to the videos that I'm going to make. So bye until then.